It's our community, and I'm Mary Davidson, and here we are again. You know, we have the most interesting neighbors, and I am always so delighted to meet new ones and become reacquainted with older ones that I have known for a very long time. This happens to be a new friend, and her name is Karen Weber, and she is an attorney with the Weber Law Offices in our area, and she practices I, you know, I have to tell you, I try to take care of myself in my older age. She practices elder law. So I thought, you know what, I like to interview nursing home people and elder <laughs> law people because you never know who I'm going to need here in this later life. And Karen practices elder law, which I find extremely interesting because um, our population is growing older quickly, and um, which has brought about a change in the law which has brought about your niche in the law, has it not? It has indeed. Yeah. Yes. And uh, talk about the elder law. I mean, you several years ago, when you went to law school, did you think about practicing elder law? I didn't, Dr. Cohen. When I was in law school, there was no course uh, offerings in the area of elder law. It's elder law as a term, I believe, was coined in 1989 by mm -hmm. a small group of attorneys who found themselves facing similar situations regarding aging clients that they were serving. Uh, and let's see, we co-founded our Kansas chapter of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys in 1998. Um, so you started out to practice what kind of law? Uh, I started out initially uh, with a litigation firm on the plaza uh -huh. here in Kansas City. Uh -huh. And while I was an associate lawyer there, I uh, approached the senior partners and I asked them if they would pay for my membership in the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. This was um, the firm I was with at that time was primarily insurance defense, uh -huh, uh -huh. and this was going to be more plaintiffs type work. The yeah. senior partners weren't sure uh, that they that was their style, right? Yeah. Right. But I convinced them that we would be developing a new practice area for the firm, and so. Well, normally they don't like to split from. I mean, they don't like to split their allegiance from defense to plaintiffs' lawyers. It's a real paradigm switch yeah, to do it so. It is. Well, yes. so are, they were very forward thinking. On yes, that. they were. So yes, I think that's were. excellent. But, but uh, you know, I, retirement age, because it changes, brings with it new difficulties. What, what do you see as some of those issues associated with the issue of retirement or whether we do so right. at the right time, you know? Or not? Right. Right. Well, I think retirement planning is multifaceted. Um, any good retirement plan is going to include financial considerations, but there's also a health care component to retirement planning. No kidding. Yes. And I think that's what elder law attorneys do. They're good at meshing those two. We have the traditional tax code, estate planning concerns, and we kind of mesh that in our planning with health care planning, planning for periods of incapacity or periods of illness when you might need assistance from family members or others to keep the bills paid, uh, speak with the doctors and healthcare professionals until one recuperates following a, a significant health crisis like a stroke or a heart attack or or even diagnosis of a chronic condition like Alzheimer's or dementia. Well, you know, that brings up kind of an interesting issue, and that is a durable power of attorney. I love to talk about durable power of attorney documents. Go. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. I, I, I would like to mention that there are two kinds of durable power of attorney documents. The first type is the health care power of attorney document. And in my practice, that's the document I think more people are familiar with. This is the legal document where we get to nominate the person or persons we trust to talk to the doctors and medical professionals and even make decisions now, for us. Now, the we is not the attorney, the we is the person. You got yeah, it. Okay. I'm speaking, I'm, I'm referring to right, the individual right. signing the right, documents. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Health care power of attorney documents. More and more people are familiar with that term and those important documents. I've learned in the course of my work that fewer people are familiar with the second kind of power of attorney document, and that's the general or financial power of attorney document. It's equally as important. 
if you think about it, if something happens and you have a medical crisis and you're unable to talk to the doctors yourself, you're probably also not able to pay the monthly bills, mm -hmm. keep up with the income tax returns that might be due in April. And so we, a person needs both health care power of attorney documents and the general power of attorney document that covers those business and financial matters. Well, you know, how important the health, uh, I want to separate them just for a minute. Okay. How important the health care document, my son was in a very, very bad accident. And so I had to become the, um, <laughs> as George Bush is the decider, uh -huh. in, in these matters because he couldn't. Right. And uh, so he was well enough to be able to sign that durable power of attorney for health care matters. So I had to make those decisions. And I, um, it's extremely important to choose well yes. that person yes. and to, to have them in order. And now the, the, the um, legal power of attorney is a little bit, can be a little bit tricky, because either one of them, because um, first of all, sometimes family members in a tight situation don't do the right thing. True. That's one. Right. And two, and I want you to take these separately or together, okay. but I'm putting you on the hot seat here. <laughs> okay. And two, sometimes the people don't have anybody. They have no children. They have outlived their spouse or their relatives, or they don't have any relatives that are willing to take that on. So to choose somebody can be a little bit tricky mm -hmm. because it's possible to um, get a hold of somebody that is not honorable. That's right. In fact, choosing the people that you name in your power of attorney documents is the critical part of these important legal documents. Uh, not only who you choose, if you have any questions about the person that you're thinking of appointing in this position, my suggestion is don't, don't put them in that position. If you're questioning their ability to carry out your best interests rather than their own best interests. If interest, in doubt, just say no. Exactly. Yeah. If yeah. in doubt, just keep them out. Uh, but I also like the other comment you share regarding your son. As an elder law attorney, a lot of my clients come to me at a time when they're making changes in life. Perhaps they're moving into an assisted living community, or the doctor has suggested that maybe they should think about giving up their driving privileges. And a lot of my clients will say, Karen, I don't want to sign power of attorney documents if I'm going to be giving up any of my remaining independence. Or decision making. Powers. Or decision making. Yeah. But I want to share with you the philosophy that I share with my clients. I really believe that having these documents in place with the persons you trust allows a per you to stay in control of your own future by, by nominating the persons you want to assist you rather than relying on the court system or a probate judge will ultimately decide who should make one's medical decisions if you're in a car accident right. and you have no power of attorney document. Or if you have no relative. Correct. I mean, you know, you can get caught either way. Sure. And that's a good point, Dr. Cohen. A lot of people assume that we have to name family members. We do not have to name family members. Sometimes not a good idea. Right. It might be better to name a trusted friend or a trusted professional. The other uh, comment I'd like to share is that we can name more than one person in our durable power of attorney documents. And I encourage that for the reasons you mentioned. Okay. It might be that the first preferred person that you name passes away before you or is in a car accident together with you. So if you're fortunate to have more than one trusted well, and person. And it's like the, the government, a series of checks and balances. If you have more than one person, then the document will say they need to agree. It, the document can say that they yeah. have to agree yeah. uh, or that they can act independently of one another. The other comment I'd like to make is that while I'm a lawyer and I love legal documents, when it comes to health care decision making and durable power of attorney documents, having conversations with the people that you've nominated about your individual thoughts and wishes in the event of an end of life or other health care decision making crisis, those conversations are critical and key to ensuring that your wishes are going to be carried out. Okay, here's another, I bet you, is a sticky wicket that comes your way too. Somebody will come in and you will talk to them about 
uh, their will or their this or their that or their durable power of attorney for health care, whatever, and they will say to you, well, I don't, I don't have any. Will you serve? Yes. Yes. And what do you say? I do get asked that question, yes. Dr. Cohen, and I would never I suggest that on my own motion. I would never suggest that I be nominated in a client's legal documents. But I must confess, over the past 20 years, I have had uh, several clients who come into my office. They have no family members. They mm -hmm. have no relatives. They have no friends who they are they believe to be capable of performing and. And so I have been nominated uh, as for some of my clients. It's my preference not to be. Not to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I would think yeah. that. You know, you make the comment that uh, it's noted that instead of a linear uh, trajectory for life, it becomes more of a cycle, a circular trajectory. Yeah. Why do you say that? Well, um, it used to be we went to work. We worked at the same company for 30 years. Got to go were, watch. <laughs> Got to go watch. Right, right, right. We retired. We traveled. We passed away. Yeah. Life doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, any number of events can develop in the course of a lifetime, and a good estate plan is going to be flexible enough to cover those contingencies and those changes that come up. You know, I look at mine every couple of years. It's important. It is, because yeah. sometimes they get a little stale and the laws change and uh, it's not well to just write it, put it in the safe deposit box and forget about it right. and 50 years later you um, give up your mortal coil as they say <laughs> and it's it doesn't do what you really would like for it to do. Yeah. So. We encourage our clients to review their documents every three to five years or after any significant change in circumstance. Mm -hmm. Retirement, mm -hmm. the death of a family member, the birth of a grandchild. And I think sometimes they don't do it because they think it's a terrible expense that they don't want to go to and really to, to amend a document is not nearly as costly as to start from scratch and usually the, um, it's an amendment not a you know the, not a complete overhaul. That's right, so, yeah. right. I, you talk about the boomers and you know everybody talks about the baby boomers, and um, I, I <laughs> you said you said something about them to live on their own terms. What what terms? <laughs> I mean, you know, how, how, explain yourself. Yeah. Well, boomers, Ms. Weber, Ms. Weber explain <laughs> yourself. <laughs> boomers um, are changing a, a lot of things. Our healthcare delivery system, the way we perform our elder law uh -huh. services, and boomers do want to do it their own way. They do not see themselves as seniors. They see themselves as... I have a flash for them. <laughs> yes. Yes. They see themselves as vital members of society. And um, so they are changing the way we deliver systems uh, here in our community and across the nation. I, they see themselves as a lot of multi-generational housing um, projects are underway. Yeah, you see people building houses, what do they call it, with a mother-in-law's? Right. My God, I, Sweet. I don't know if I'd like to do that yeah. or not. I want to stay in my house yes. with my dog and be peaceful. I don't, I don't think I'd like to live with my children. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, a surprising statistic. They haven't asked, by the by. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. You're yes. safe so yes, far. Safe so far. <laughs> um, but housing development is yeah. beginning to show that yeah. trend. Homes yeah. are being designed with the idea of multi generational yeah. Yeah, uh, living environments. Yeah. I recently learned that nationwide, um, approximately 10% of the children being raised in the United States are being raised by grandparents. That was a surprising that number to me. I do, and you know, that puts a real burden on grandparents. Um, people with modest means have to do estate planning too, uh, for that reason and many other reasons. Right. But um, I think they overlook uh, the possibilities of charitable remainder unit trusts, mm -hmm. of um, uh, irrevocable trust. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of things out from which they can get the income during their, and some of them have two lives. Right. So right. I, yeah. I mean, do you, that's part of your 
estate plan. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, charitable remainder trusts can be designed uh, particularly well suited if an individual has an asset in their portfolio that has appreciated significantly in value. Uh, and like stock in a stock company, yeah. or real estate interests, and if the or if the individual wants to increase their income, uh, lots of different planning opportunities uh, for individuals. And a good retirement plan is going to consider not just the financial um, picture and the healthcare concerns, but the types of assets that an individual owns. Does this person have highly appreciated assets that need to be transferred? Uh, and the timing of those transfers well, and... Let's, let's pull that out just a minute. The uh -huh. timing of those transfers is very important. Let's, let's use an example. Let us assume that uh, a, a, a parents have started a business from nothing and they have made it into something with a capital S. So it's mm -hmm. highly appreciated and there may be, it may be a closely held corporation, mm -hmm. subchapter S corporation, all those kind of things. And so the transfer of that to, to minimize the tax um, um, implications, that's very important. Absolutely. You can't do it when you die. Right. I mean, you got to think ahead. That's right. That's right. And and that's what a good estate plan will do. The so sooner a person how do you, what starts, do you do that? How, what do you tell them to do? Yeah. Well, we always want to minimize clients want to minimize taxes, right? All of our right. taxes, right. estate taxes and capital gains taxes right. on appreciated assets. The other thing I'd like to share, your comment reminds me that a lot of people think only the wealthy need an estate plan, but Dr. Cohen, yes, everybody Dr. over age 18 needs an estate plan. When is the best time to transfer those appreciated assets? Well, prior to one's death in many situations. Well, but how much prior? Uh, well, that really depends on the client. Um, it, again, it's... Well, doesn't it have to be a couple of years? Oh, yes. Yeah, we don't want it to be. Yes, yes. I practice law without a license. <laughs> I tell you. Yes, <laughs> yes um, and I say the sooner a person plans, the better. The greater, not only the greater asset preservation, but the greater taxes can be minimized. And you do have to be careful because I'm sure that the, the parents may say, well, I'm not sure I want to do that because my children will push me out of the business. You know, yeah. everybody's not um, as get not, doesn't get along as well as one might hope, uh, and so they say, "Well, I don't want to do that." Right. It can be hard to yeah. give up measures, Giving measures up of control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. Yeah. And they don't want to. They have to have an income of some sort. In other words, they can't just give away the business and all it holds. They have to be able to work for the business or have a contract for, you know, those are the kind yes. of things that are really, I think, tricky. Right. And right. Boy, if you lose your marbles, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And yeah. we want to have a succession plan in place. Exactly, exactly. And that's extremely important. You know, um, the gift tax exemption, that's, talk about that a little bit. The gift tax exemption. Yeah. You know, when I first started practicing, the gift tax exemption was, I believe, $600,000. Today, it's $5.34 million. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So... Uh, that, now, that's what I can give my child during his lifetime. You can... You, each individual can if transfer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we yeah, had that yeah. much, right? Um, each individual can transfer $5.3 million, either during their lifetime or at their death or partly during their lifetime. Part and part, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's an, a lifetime exemption mm -hmm. from our estate taxes. Is that a good thing to do? Uh, yes, I think we all want to, you know, anything in excess of that $5.3 million is going to be taxed at, at one percent? Death. Do you, you remember? The highest rate is, what is it now, 55%? 55, I think so. Yes. And mm -hmm. the lowest rate is, what, about 28? Yes, something like yes. That. Mm -hmm. And I, a lot of folks think, you know, this money has been taxed during the course of our lifetime, first with income taxes and, of course, real estate and property so they're taxes. There's a or they see it as they're paying right, twice. Right, yeah, and, right. I, and I understand that. I, um, you know, <laughs> and, you know, the Medicaid spend down is another thing. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, Medicaid spend You know, health care is a major problem for all of us. It is probably the single greatest mm -hmm. cause of mm -hmm. financial uh, or bankruptcy issues is the cost of medical care. And Medicaid is a program available to help individuals with the extraordinary cost of nursing home care. 
generally it's a joint federal state program. Some of the laws are federal in nature and are going to be consistent state to state. But each of the states ad administers and interprets the, the program differently. So there are some different differences between the states. Generally speaking, there are five exempt assets. Um, a person can own a home and their household belongings, uh, funeral plans, prearranged and prepaid funeral plans, one vehicle per family, and life insurance uh, with limited cash value. Isn't that sort of like the bankruptcy laws? Uh, similar, some mm -hmm. of those are similar. Mm -hmm. So five exempt assets and then uh, in Kansas, a, an individual can have no more than $2,000 of countable assets in addition to their five exempt assets. Okay, so are we seeing some sort of a tie-in between transferring your assets at the right time and being ready for the, uh, if you think you're gonna need Medicaid? Correct, correct. You know, and this is not for the very wealthy we're talking about. Right, this is, yeah. right. The very wealthy are able to privately it. pay right. for or self-insure their extended long-term right. care. The middle-class Americans struggle to do that. But see, the transfer of assets is really important to do it at the right time. Correct, yeah. correct. You, you can't give your assets away today and uh -uh. go apply for Medicaid assistance tomorrow. The feds say, uh -uh. <laughs> no, 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 you can't do that. Right. Yeah, so, right. But that's why it's so important to see an attorney that specializes in, um, I, I don't even need to say elder care, it's uh, arranging your life as you age, yeah. I mean really. A plan and putting a plan in place so that you have greater assurance that your individual wishes are going to be carried out should something happen and you're not able to advocate for yourself any longer. That's right, and some of us are not. I mean, right. I just ha had a high school reunion and there were three people there that were getting really fuzzy. They had Alzheimer's and um, you could tell when you, t I mean, they weren't, you know, able to be, they were taking care of their, sort of taking care of their business, mm -hmm. but we had a terrific discussion what happened 50 years ago, but we couldn't remember what we had for breakfast, you know. <laughs> right. So that's not, that's a real problem. Well, it is, Dr. Cohen, and these documents that we're discussing today have to be executed and put in place before a person becomes impaired. Exactly, right? exactly. To be valid. And that's, that is an issue that I wanted to discuss with you as well. Okay. When does the court say you are impaired? At what point can a document become invalid? Yes, well, um, only a court of law has the authority to determine another person incapacitated. Stated another way, we are all presumed to be competent until a court of law declares us incompetent. Okay, so the lawyer doesn't get to decide who's competent and who's not competent. A court decides that issue. The durable power of attorney documents that we were discussing earlier, these documents are meant to avoid the need for a court-ordered determination about an individual's competency. Power of attorney documents are meant to keep people out of the probate court system and that court-ordered guardianship process. If you have your documents in place before you have a heart attack, before you're in a car accident, then, then the, the goal and, and the idea is that we won't need for a court to determine you to be in. And the probate court costs are, can be heavy. They can be heavy. Anytime you're in the courthouse, you're talking right. about a waste of time and money, well, in my, my opinion. Well, my husband, who was an attorney, this is really kind of funny, he had a client, Ann Helen, we always called her, uh -huh. Ann Helen was either 99 or 100, and okay. she had a friend who died who left her some money, mm -hmm. and she had to live a year and be competent before she could get, so he uh -huh. had to drag her out there to the court uh -huh. so that they could see huh. her when she inherited the money, and then a year later he had to take her back. Huh. She was sharp as a tack, <laughs> and she did get her money. She lived to be 102, 103. She went to the flower show in London at 100, so Interesting. she was doing fine. But but the court had to see her to be certain that she was. Yeah. so. I guess the point I'm trying to make is the court system is established to protect the citizen. It is. And maybe kind of a pain to have to go through it, yeah. but it is a protection. You are right. So it I, is there for a good reason. It is. It is. And I and I think that um, I don't know. You know, uh, another another question that I'm sure you 
you get talked about is a tie-in policy for Medicare, mm -hmm. uh, long-term health insurance. Yeah. You have to know about that too. Yes. I am a big believer in long-term care insurance. Uh, these are policies designed to help pay for the extraordinary cost of assisted living and skilled nursing care, as well as in-home care. We all want to stay in our homes, right? I do. Me too. I'm voting yes. <laughs> yes, I do. So a good long-term care insurance policy is going to provide for that sort of coverage as well. Some of the older policies ages ago covered only nursing home care. Again, yeah. we want to avoid the nursing home care if we can. So a, a good long-term care policy will cover both in-home care, assisted living, and skilled nursing care. This is a little point, but it was important to me. I have a dog. Yes, that's important. And if anything would happen to me, I want that dog taken care of. Yeah. So the dog is in the will. Good. And I have talked to somebody. I mean, to me, that's important to take care of things while you still can. Talk to somebody if the dog is well and healthy. I yes. mean, if he's near dead too, then that's different. Yes. We can put him to sleep. Right. But if he's well and healthy, yeah. a person that I know has very pleasantly agreed to take him, uh -huh. and I have left enough money to take care of him. I think that's important. Pet trusts, pet trusts. Uh, are becoming more popular. As and is pet health insurance. <laughs> yes, right. by the way. Right. But no, pet trusts. Talk yes. about that a little bit. Yes. Well, they, they are becoming more popular uh -huh. because pets are an important part of our families. And, but I like your, in, in your story that you shared with us, it's important to ask the individuals that you think would be get good care providers for the pets. Ask if they would be willing to provide that care to the important pet members of your family. Yeah, and so you get that all lined up ahead of time. Right. And you know, I think no matter how, how good your children are or how uh, devoted your sisters, brothers, whatever may be, um, we all have certain wishes, you mm -hmm. know, that we want carried out. So the best thing to do is to see an attorney uh, who specializes in that kind of thing and get it taken care of. And it's it's a, a favor to yourself and a favor to your whoever you leave behind. It really is a gift to your family. But, and also, Dr. Cohen, most of my clients say that it brings them a sense of peace once yeah. they've taken care of it for themselves. Yeah, it does. You see the future of elder law changing real quickly? I do, yes. I, obviously, the boomers are, oh, yes. are going to bring lots of, uh, yes, there they are again. The practice of elder law is ever-changing, both from our tax code perspective, mm -hmm. our Medicare and Medicaid rules are constantly changing, and um, so... Well, uh, if they ever change, it's very complicated tax code, your business is going to be booming with the boomers. <laughs> we can only hope, yes, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right, exactly. But it does, because the world is changing so rapidly. Even, even as we consider the, the, the possibility, uh, the reality, really, it's not a possibility, it's a reality, that we're citizens of the world. Mm -hmm. We are. And we, um, we're no longer uh, so provincial. So our estates um, to take a little care and we're living a lot longer right. and living longer is a bane and a boon because uh, you know we're not as well and we're uh, more of a drain on the health care system and and sometimes on ourselves so we have to figure out how to make our money stretch as we get older absolutely and that's what you do it is so I just I think it's a an interesting profession to be in at this particular time in uh, uh, the world, and I, um, I think um, I, I predict your business is going to get better. We stay really busy. <laughs> we stay really busy, and we enjoy. It's very satisfying it work. Is. I know it is because you have people say, you know, I rest easier now. I hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I also think that. Um, Yes, it does cost money to do that, but I think the money is is well spent. I do, yeah. I, I, I do it myself. So I, you know, I I'm o only taking the advice that I give. Yeah. But I think it's important. I appreciate those. I mean, my comments. funeral is paid for. 
It's all picked out, everything is picked out and paid for. Do you know I continue to be surprised by surviving family members who call and say, thank what goodness mom took care of that. Or what will I do? Right. Yeah. We just don't make good decisions, particularly financial decisions, while mm -hmm. we're grieving. While we're grieving and, and upset. But you sure. know, I think that as I thank Karen Weber uh, of the Weber Law Offices, I, I think that we have, through you performed a great service for our neighbors here and give them something to think about. And the other thing that I think is that as we pursue justice, it has many facets and takes many forms. And seeing a good attorney is really the first step in that direction. So thanks, Karen. Thanks. Nice Thank to meet you. Thank you for being with us. It's always a pleasure and I'll see you soon again.